to the Lending Technology Think Tank. My name is Colin White. I'm from Credit Connect Media. Um, you're, we welcome you to our final session of the day at this uh, Lending Technology Think Tank, uh, where we'll discuss shortly digital lending. Um, but before we proceed with that, I just wanted to, uh, as usual, just give people who haven't joined us before a quick run through of the options that you can do to be part of this event, um, potentially. So. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see a number of icons. I'll run through them quickly. You've got an eye information, so you've got information on the event. And if you click on, on that at the bottom, we've got information on our future events as well that we've got across. We tend to run these uh, think tanks virtually every six months. And at the end of the year, we're going to do a face-to-face -face one alongside our um, Credit and Collection Technology Awards. So um, any involvement with that in the future would be great to, to hear from you. Uh, second part of that, um, we've got the profiles and our speakers in this session, so please have a click on that. And then finally, there's some links to um, externally where you can get involved with our events and stuff in the future, and also find out a bit more about our sponsor today who have been experienced. I just want to quickly thank them for their support. But um, let's move on with the final session of the day. Oh, sorry, one last thing. Um, the icon on the left is a speech bubble. Questions, please send us some questions. Quite light on them today. So if you want to be involved and ask good questions or even pass comment on the event, do that. And socially as well, do that via LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, but let's move on with the final session of the day where we're going to look at digital lending. Um, I will hand over to Chris Warburton now, who is our chair for the day. He'll introduce himself and the panellists. So Chris, over to you. Thanks, Colin. <clears throat> Appreciate it. So uh, welcome everyone to the last session of the day. Uh, just in case you didn't uh, join the previous sessions, um, you know, my, um, uh, my, my just to introduce myself, my name is Chris Warburton. Um, so, yeah, I've been I'm going to be the chair for the event. So I've been my background, a little my background. So I've been in um, in the financial services industry for like the last 20 odd years, mainly in sort of risk operations. So that's everything from sort of credit underwriting all the way through fraud and then and then collections in the back end. Um, so you say, say I'm the chair for the day. We've had three really good sessions so far. We've talked about credit risk and the cost of living challenge, which we know is sort of top of mind for folks. Uh, we've got uh, measuring affordability. Um, so, you know, how do we make sure we're making affordable loans and looking at customer outcomes? Last, we just we just talked about regulations, uh, particularly around consumer duty, what's happening there. And on this one here, we're going to talk about digital lending and digital lending technology. So, uh, uh, and joining me today, um, are we've got three really great sort of panelists. We've got Andrew Fisher, uh, who's a group managing director for Freedom Finance. And uh, we've got Brian Leslie, who's the managing director of Prima Finance, um, uh, you know, and sorry, um, yeah, and sorry, Prima Finance from the alternative and salary finance uh, sort of a lending space based in Ireland. Um, and, and Andrew works for Freedom Finance Group, but obviously in the digital consumer lending and helping cover customers sort of navigate borrowing as well. Um, and then we've got Alabenga King, who's the founder and CEO of, of um, BSL Financial Services, and they're in the mortgage finance space. And I know that Alabenga has had a few uh, challenges joining us uh, for now, so so I think he's going to join us when he can and he gets the the technology sorted out. So uh, so he'll hopefully join us halfway through the through the discussion. So um, so to really just to start off, I suppose around digital digital lending technology. I mean, it's been a, a huge focus on 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 digital the last sort of you know yeah you know, three or four years, I suppose, especially since uh, since COVID. Um, and it'd be good to sort of um, good to understand. So, like, what are some of the trends that you're kind of seeing in terms of digital lending? And so, like, you know, is it is it still sort of you know picking up speed as a trend, um, or is it sort of like starting to plateau off? I mean, Andrew, do you want to sort of maybe just take that first? Yeah, we'll do. Thanks. Um, there's definitely more interest in digital lending, um, both from consumers and from new entrants and new lenders coming to the market. Mm -hmm. Existing lenders are also consuming more digital processes, trying to make themselves more efficient, improve their own margins, be able to pass that saving on to a customer um, and just improve the all-round offering to customers. There is, it's interesting the pace of how existing lenders in, in the marketplace are adopting more digital processes. Mm -hmm. there, some are certainly more active and, and kind of getting after it quicker than, than others and uh, some are not adopting it at all and, and sticking to existing, I guess, more traditional methods of, of underwriting and lending. From a consumer uptake perspective, we have seen at Freedom, we, we have seen a decent uptake from customers engaging with new digital lending practices and processes where there is a, a kind of recognized value exchange for the customer to uh, to start to engage in a slightly different way than how they've traditionally done so. So where, where we can offer a reason to the customer for them to do so, 
they are doing that and it is leading to kind of increased lending decisions um, and perhaps lending options that weren't uh, that wouldn't otherwise be available without these digital technologies. Do, do you think it's really been the digital change has really been driven by I suppose saving cost um, as a drafting cheaper service or do you think it's really around sort of like increasing market share? I mean, what, what do you think sort of driven the, the, the focus on, on digital? Uh, I think both of those to be, you know, to completely sit on the fence with the answer, uh, mm. I think both of them are, are true. And I also think the, the backdrop of the pandemic, uh, it was also a, a kind of spike or a driver in the move towards digital as kind of accessing more traditional lending methods, getting hold of bank statements, pay slip, going into a branch or, or whatever of a lender became um, obviously not not possible for a period of time. So that certainly spurred people into action when it came to digital. From a, from a market share perspective, uh, absolutely. I think lend, new entrants to market that are entering from a digital only or a digital first perspective are coming in from a market share point of view and existing lenders are doing it more to um, kind of open up credit risk with new data sets that are available through digital processes and APIs, um, but also to maintain or increase their market share as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Brett, Brian, you're obviously based in um, based in Ireland. I mean, good to, what, what are you seeing within the Irish market in terms of digital lending? It's been a big thing, obviously. We've seen it sort of like you know face to face here in the in the UK. But what what are you seeing? What are you seeing in in Ireland? Is it similar kind of themes? I think it's similar themes, absolutely, Chris. I suppose our background is we we started asset finance, car finance back in 2018, mm -hmm. and we started unsecured personal lending uh, kind of the late in 2020. Um, so I suppose. It always meant we were more focused on, on a digital first focus and platform that's been our driver and, and i suppose when you're setting up from a new uh, a greenfield site it's easier you know you're, you don't have any legacy issues and things like that mm. i suppose the other thing is in ireland um you know we've got a changing landscape in, in the banks we had five main retail banks uh two of those are now closing down here ulster bank that's owned by natwest and kbc that's owned by a belgian bank so the landscape is changing but yes the main uh, three remaining banks has still very much a branch network, even though they're reducing that. But they have put a lot of emphasis as well in digital focus and di digital, you know, uh, channel distribution channels as well. So it is very much similar, I would suspect, to the UK. Um, it's very much evolving, and we'll get on to sure. Sh I'm sure shortly uh, how the, how that it can be all complemented and implemented. But it's about market share. It's about streamlining processes, making processes more efficient, cost effective. Um, and more productive overall. I suppose that's been our experience and focus on, on the digital focus on, on, our, on our lending side of things. Okay. And uh, Olabengo, thanks very much for, for joining. I'm glad you got your um, technology issue sorted out. So that's yes, I do. <laughs> uh, so we were just talking about uh, digital adoption, I suppose digital lending that's, 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 that's been in the market over the last few years. I mean, in your space, which is the mortgage sector space, have you seen, have you seen more digital processes being introduced or do you find that, that the adoption there has been, been slower? Well, it's it's actually increased, if I'm going to be honest, because we have seen what we're seeing is uh, new lenders coming in that they're more digital based than mm. the old ones. And the, even the existing ones are sort of trying to figure out how to take advantage of the banking system, the, the digital space that they're finding themselves in to be more competitive and also make it quicker to process cases so we we are having to do more of cases with lenders platform that are constantly changing where it's more automated than manual so it's just it's it's making it more efficient but at the same time it's creating a new sort of problems yeah and i suppose what kind of what kind of role does technology play in things like i suppose affordability assessment we talked a bit about that earlier earlier in the session i mean are you sort of seeing that as a as a theme that's coming through in terms of the, like improving speed of decision making is that is that is that what you mean by that yeah that's what i meant by the problems we're seeing because um we do get some cases where on a, previously it would have been passed through the system but because the way the technology is set up now those cases are automatically declined and the we now have to call in for mm -hmm. them to manually change it at the back end to allow the case to progress. So even though it's allowing the smooth process from our side, it's creating a little bit extra work for us that we would normally do that because we're having to call them and you're having to take longer on the phone to get to lenders now. 
now we need to. Yeah, I mean, Andrew, what's your your kind of view on that in terms of, like, I suppose, automated decision making? So, because you make it very fast for, let's say, ninety five percent of customers, but then you still have that five percent that maybe it becomes longer. Um, you know, so um, I mean, I mean, and, and I use an example, right? For example, around automation. So I was, I went to buy a train ticket. I think I used this in the, when we were chatting before, and say so there were five ticket windows open. And normally, I normally I buy it on my phone or I go to the uh, the ticket machine, but I had to go to the window. And it took me longer than it would have done because there are only two people, uh, two of the windows open because they, you know, they didn't need the people normally. Do you think we're in the same kind of situation there with digital? I mean, does it make it overall faster? I mean, what what are the dynamics there? Do you think? In um, it's interesting you, you you mentioned the number ninety five percent. I think where where we're seeing at the moment is probably around sixty percent of mm -hmm. the applications that we process are distributed through a pure digital end to end, so with no human intervention. And with very little action on behalf of the customer um, outside of the application process the and and they are what we would all class as uh, kind of vanilla lending decisions so it, it's good on affordability it's got a decent credit score customers are not looking to borrow too much or for too an obscure a purpose um, and and it's it, it's easy to automate vanilla underwriting processes where we're still seeing digital um, digital adoption not quite get there and where we are seeing increased inefficiencies to the point you just made is actually what is now becoming a, a gray area because it is there where there's further information than needed so affordability can't quite be assessed on a digital basis then a customer's having to produce either pay slips or physical bank statements or we're having to play a part in that in terms of packaging the customer up for the unsecured digital lender that can't quite underwrite fully digital if it's a if it's a non-vanilla application so even within the same lender they can have multiple processes um and and adopt digital for different customers and do you think those cases were were, were always there and we just now see them because that they've, they've been sort of left in left in a, they've been concentrated in a, in a smaller population or are, they, or are we able to make new decisions as a result of that and taking the, the easier cases out i mean is it, is it adding cost or is it or were they always there anyway no. I definitely think it's it's a case of adding cost in in, in a lot of the um, in a lot of the decisions that have been made because this is still an evolving movement into digital and so lenders are not always able to uh, to decision positively or negatively so they'll go into a manual process whereas before because of they had kind of more vanilla decisioning they may have said actually no this is just a no because we don't have a process whereas now so much is going through digital they are able to take on more processing with existing staff to be able to manually underwrite and take learnings from those that manual underwriting to then move that into automated decisioning. It's yeah. creating more work for the lender than they would have done previously, but it is opening up the amount of offers being made to customers as a result. So it's probably added cost, but then it's probably it's added lending on top, right? Which yes. is because now we've got the time to be able to to be able to do that. I mean, I mean, and Brian, I suppose just in terms of like the particularly the, the interplay between the the subprime space or the the near prime space and sort of like the the prime space. Do you think it's the, do you think it's allowing some of the so to the large banks to maybe move down market, which sort of squeezes where some of the people who are making much more of these individual decisions with higher interest rates. I mean, is it changing the dynamics between that or maybe moving the market boundaries, do you think, a little bit? I think potentially that's the way we do is, Chris, we, we price based on risk uh, mm. for some of our products. So, um, you know, as Andrew said, the vanilla straightforward uh, customer that fits the box and fits the under criteria, under automated underwriting works very well there. But then uh, other cases that we probably may have been declined before are now being dealt with by more manual intervention and manual underwriting. To answer your question, um, the Irish banks are still pretty very risk averse and mm. they don't really, that's the big difference between the UK and the Irish market. Uh, and that's why we entered the Irish market because we felt there was a significant gap in the market in that mid prime subprime space. The Irish banks don't really do mid prime stuff. They're very much a set pricing um, and it's very much for prime prime customers and they're very fixed and you know that's probably where the mass market is and that's where their focus is but i suppose that's where we feel there's significant opportunities in those other areas that mid prime space we're doing a lot of risk analysis in our portfolio at the moment again to help us to be able to cases that we're currently declining could we approve some of those 
through open banking, but also just through better risk analysis and things like that and learning from our existing, uh, you know, portfolio. So it's mm. a moving piece, but to answer your question, the Irish banks are not really, um, you know, looking at the mid-prime, sub-prime space at the moment. And just to, I suppose, just to, to explore that a little bit more, I mean, when we were chatting earlier, you were talking about one of the big differences between the UK and, and, and the Irish markets was, you know, a cap on interest rates. I think it was a 26% yeah. cap you talked about, which we don't have here. Uh, and I think we were sort of like, we, we were saying, well, what, what dynamics would that happen on the market here if that was to happen? So I think I think you're right in saying that this, it happens in a few sort of like um, uh, uh, euro markets, so driven by the ECB. So it's like, I mean, what's what's been the impact on the on the Irish market in terms of actually having that cap? So the background there is last year they changed legislation, so they capped interest rates at a 23% APR for hard purchase, PCP, um, and for also personal lending. So mm. again, that doesn't naturally hugely affect the, the main banks because they were more at the very, very prime right. space. But um, there is a significant market there that was at that you know mid prime sub prime, and it's 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 been very challenging because not only have you a reduction in the APR you can charge. We have a practically a doubling of borrowing costs because of the DCB rises and in interest rates. So mm -hmm. it has reduced net interest mark margins, and therefore it reduces the the level of risk you can take on, and therefore it also makes the the credit market uh, less less available to people that would have a some part of a checkered history or no credit history. So it's challenging, um, but we still think there's opportunities there, uh, and we're very busy at the moment. But there's very few in the space. Yeah, and I suppose you, you're reacting to that by just improving your credit risk yeah. assessment and underwriting in terms of finding where there's where there's opportunity. I mean, I mean, uh, Andrew and Olabenga, what I mean, what do you think the reaction would be? What would be the consequences maybe if we, if we were to have that kind of that cap cap on interest rates here? Do you think? I mean, Andrew, Andrew do you want to go first? Yeah, um, I mean, I was quite surprised we were all speaking previously to hear that rate cap in the Irish market. Um, and I, it's not something I see coming into the UK market anytime soon, for sure. I mean, it's hard to say it would never come in. I think it would have a significant impact right now. There is a, you know, a lot of um, borrowing done for low loan amounts in the UK market. So kind of one, two, three thousand over a short period of time. It's difficult for lenders to make um, a profit margin on that if it's at lower interest rates. So that's typically where we see higher interest rates being charged is for that shorter term. I'm not talking high cost short term or payday here. It is kind of prime market borrowing, but even so, for a lender to make a margin, I think they would struggle at those rate caps for those customers. I think it would um, remove a whole section of products out of the market for prime and near prime customers before we even start thinking about financial inclusion for those customers that are deemed slightly higher risk or thin file or new entrants to the financial market or th the borrowing and lending market. So, yeah, I think it would have a significant impact on the UK lending market for all prime, mid prime and sub prime customers. Yeah, uh, Olabenga, what was what was your reaction to it? Uh, I think mine will be the same as Andrew's because uh, let's say for example, last year that we had the changes in the the budget, we could sort of see the 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 impact that mini budget had on the system, especially lending. So the banks were more focused on will it be profitable for them to lend and how to adapt to the system so if there's a cap in the uk it will definitely be a negative one in terms of the ability for lenders to be more creative in terms of product to make it more accessible for adverse near prime and all those sort of um, lenders all those sort of clients so it will be a challenging one for us and i really don't see it happening like andrew said ne not, never say never but yeah. Possibly not. <laughs> what, 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 um, I don't know how many of you were on the last session. We were just talking about, um, you know, does does the regulator get involved in pricing? Uh, was one of the pieces that did come up, and it's kind of it does feel like a bit of a, I don't want to say a nuclear option, but it sounds like it was almost like a step above what we've got now in terms of like regulation. Just whether whether we go there or whether that's been kept in reserve or not, I don't know. I thought it was, um, I mean, Brian, I thought just it was very interesting in terms of like just, you know, where where things have gone elsewhere in terms of what they what the impact could be on here. Um, I mean, in terms of like, in terms of your reaction to it, I mean, we, we just, I mean, Brian, we just, we talked a little about, um, you know, changing the credit risk scores, I mean, but what, what kind of like technology can you use, I suppose, because, because digital is a way of sort of taking cost out to be able to, to be able to increase the margin that Andrew talked about, right? So, so how, do, how are you sort of reacting to that? I mean, is digital a way of sort of enabling, you know, uh, underwriting or lending for, for an increased population? Do you sort of see it that way as well as sort of, which obviously changing credit risk cutoff scores. 
Absolutely. I mean, I suppose our reaction and look, it's our, our focus always is with interest rate caps, it focuses the mind. Uh, you need a very efficient, streamlined uh, process and digital is critical to that. It's central to that. So I suppose we um, for, take our unsecured personal lending. Um, the, the vast majority of that we never speak to the customers, you know, 95, 98 percent of customers, we never speak to them. So it's very much a, a digital focused only. Um, the underwriting is pretty much automated. Yes, there is over, some oversight there from underwriters, but it does a huge amount of screening. I mean, we get hundreds and hundreds of applications on a weekly basis for personal loans but thankfully uh, we started off manually checking those and it was just incredibly time consuming and too slow mm. now uh, they're filtered through an automated underwriting process and we're only in the up looking at the cases that have been approved by the process and it, it's made a, it's been a game changer for us so you know it's critical to having a streamlined and efficient and productive system uh, from start to finish from origination collections and so forth we probably feel uh, the digital side of things that I mean open banking will probably come on to, but we probably feel the whole digital automating is going to be very interesting. We're, it's a project we're looking at this year and the whole collections, arrears, customer servicing side of things after the loan has been issued or the origination has been done. That's an area that I suppose we're also focused on. You know, you have the customer duty in the UK. Um, does, you know, if you're dealing with vulnerable customers, can that become part of open banking, assessing their vulnerability, assessing their actual true affordability after the loan has been originated. So we feel that's the next area as well that, that uh, we, we want to start looking at uh, in the whole digital journey. I mean, I mean, I mean uh, Andrew, how, how do you feel about I suppose, the digital journey? I mean, we mentioned two things there. One of them, open banking has been a potential in terms of like, uh, you know, adding additional information for underwriting. But then it also goes back to also what you mentioned, Brian, I suppose, in terms of uh, uh, customer outcomes, particularly with consumer duty in the UK. I mean, that's that's uh, that's something that that's coming in over here that we're going to have to be very focused on too. I mean, I mean, is 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 digital a way out to sort of like take cost out? I mean, is are you seeing that? And is, is open banking something that you think is uh, you know, the main opportunity? Uh, I think open finance, as opposed to just open banking, is is the is a huge opportunity. Whether it becomes the main opportunity or not, we we may still be too um, early uh, early in the adoption of it. There are different approaches to the use of open banking, which which at the moment is is not really helping consumer adoption. Actually, the biggest challenge that I think we're facing is consumer adoption of open banking above lender adoption of open banking. So lenders are starting to consume open banking data and they're using it in different ways. Some of some lenders just using it for negative selection, only using it to kind of say no earlier in the journey, which is still a good customer outcome because the customer is informed of the decision earlier in the process. There are a few lenders that are open banking only in terms of their decisioning and 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 they will confidently say that the swap set of it, data coming from open banking as opposed to just using cra is around a kind of a one in five for every one they decline they're they're approving five that they otherwise wouldn't have done by seeing the open banking data and that's really encouraging and, and really positive to to see interestingly though those lenders are new entrants to the market that don't have the legacy processes, staffing costs, people costs that they're trying to turn around from being manual to digital. And that is a real challenge for lenders that in terms of being able to move from a manual to a digital lender, there's a huge operational process to get that done. And as such, they're not moving as quickly as I think we, as a market, we thought they might have done when open banking um, on PSD2, when it, when it was all launched. And that then, as I say, is leading to a lower consumer adoption because 80% of the lenders on, on Freedom's panel has no open banking processes and we have 60 some lenders on panel. And that leaves the balance that does. So do we put open banking in the journey for the 20% of lenders that do, or do we not have it in the journey and not have the friction point because there are 80% of lenders that don't use open banking in decisioning? I think we've got some way to go to get parity uh, across all lenders in terms of the use or non-use of open banking before we can really say to consumers, you all should go through an open banking journey because it will improve customer outcomes. I think we are some time, maybe years away from that. And what's, 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 what's the hesitancy of, of consumers, do you think, in terms of adopting it? I mean, because it's great from an information point of view, from a, from a business point of view. But I mean, what, what's, what's the hesitancy, do you think, that's from a consumer point of view? Uh, it's value exchange. I keep coming back to that phrase. They were, there are, say, eighty percent of our lending is done through non-open banking journeys, and as mm. such, a customer doesn't have to. They don't need to to use open banking in order to get a lending or a borrowing decision. As such, why why would they go through that? 
if um, if there isn't a need, if, if there isn't a uniformed approach. Every customer is aware they have to have a credit score done on them. So 95% of, of borrowing is taken out with the use of a credit score that the customer consents to and a lender will then make a credit risk decision based off that information. As we move towards open banking being used in decisioning more mainstream and through more lenders, that will then become a normal part of a customer's journey from uh, having a financial need to then being given some borrowing off a lender and some way from that. Yeah. Do you think there's a bit of an analogy there with uh, digital adoption? I'm um, going back to digital lending, which is remember back before before KB we had the same conversations around uh, and our open banking, but also around digital adoption and almost like the pandemic forced us into using digital adoption, and then we could see the digital then we could see the value exchange. Do you think do you think we're at the same kind of moment with with open banking, which is we know it's there, but if we don't have to use it, we won't because we're kind of creatures of habit to a certain extent as consumers. Well, I am at uh, least anyway. <laughs> I couldn't I couldn't have phrased it any better. I think that's exactly where we are. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Olavenga, what, what do you think in terms of the, 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 the mortgage market, in terms of open banking? What kind of a, adoption are you, are you kind of seeing there? Uh, I think um, I'll, I'll let me start with an example. I had a case uh, recently that for the client was sent uh, a link to accept and give consent to open banking. And when the client did that and the system was pulled up, it scared the guy so much so that he called us to tell them that he doesn't, he doesn't want to go through with that anymore because he just felt that it was too much information mm. that the bank had access to. And he wanted to control what sort of information he was willing to share. Mm. Because with the open banking, it means all his bank statements were pulled in. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what we are experiencing that. Our sort of clients are more mindful of oversharing and with open banking it means everything sort of is made available and the mistrust or not wanting to give too much information to to the banks is where we're finding it difficult to sort of get our clients to be more open to the to the mm -hmm. benefits of open banking or open finance so it's it's been a challenge but in terms of the benefit for the client that are happy to proceed, it's made it more efficient for us. Mm -hmm. Not just for us, but for the bank as well to process and quickly get to a decision like Andrew said, than they would have if it's underwritten. So we're, we're getting to offer quicker than we normally would. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's a question here just around, just while we're on open banking, around open banking payments, which, which certainly in, in later in the lifestyle seems to they, they seems to be wider adoption of that than the, as we're looking through the, the various bank transactions. I mean, is, is that is that kind of what you've kind of seen as well? Um, kind of interested in that data. But I mean, Brian, Brian uh, we, which you, you have a, you must have open yeah. banking in, uh, in in Ireland in some way. Are you seeing that in terms of do you have the payment with payments as well? No, just I suppose to share our experience there, Chris. Um, one of our customer journeys, um, we have an option. It's it just interesting. We give an option to either upload bank statements, um, mm. you know, just PDFs or whatever, or completing open banking. 50% of customers now doing that journey are doing the open banking. So that's the first thing, which is which is higher than where it was a couple of years ago. Um, so we do see the uptake and the use of open banking increasing. That's just to provide us with the data to help our underwriting decision. The other area where it's also helpful is we find an increasing trend in Ireland where Money is paid from their salary wages into a bank account, and then there's huge transfers to another account, for example, with Revolut. Mm -hmm. And then from an underwriting point of view, that brings its own challenges because you're saying, what's going on? There's big transfers. We need to see that other account. And again, open banking makes that very easy and straightforward. So we are seeing increasing uptake of open banking where we give the, the, the customer an option. They can upload bank statements or do the open banking, but an increasing percentage are doing that. On the payment side, no. I think the UK market would be well ahead of the payments the bank-to-bank -bank payments uh we're not really seeing that happening uh, taking off yet here but we are seeing a good uptake in open banking just for transferring data and downloading the data but not on payments yeah yeah i mean and, and just uh, just continue on the on the on the digital and office efficiencies i mean are there any other technologies outside of open banking that you think we've got to we've, we've got to we've got to we've got to look at i mean we talk a bit about some of the other calls around you know additional data sources i mean as other things that we're are there other other rocks out there that we're not uncovering that you think we need to look at in terms of like 
you know, making other lending decisions more efficiently or, uh, you know, improve, improving the decisions we make to further expand lending. Uh, Andrew, um, do you got any? Yes, any oh, sorry, Brian, Andrew. Brian, 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 go, go ahead. Well, okay. it'd be interesting to see what Andrew has to say, but I, I suppose from our point of view, we're not using any. Um, mm -hmm. Look, the big challenge is always you can assess affordability and you you can you know tap into the the, the credit history and so forth um and then you have people with a thin file or a very limited credit history at all and it's trying to determine you know their willingness uh, rather than, than their ability to repay and that's that's a new challenge whether other data sources or there's other rocks out there that could help us people with thin files or very limited credit history whether we could get a better picture on you know as i say some people can pay but just don't and um, some people can pay and, and that has to be just so whether we could use other data to help us determine people's propensity or willingness to pay um aside from affordability that that's probably an interesting one um but interesting what the other speakers have to say i mean just just before we go on to that i mean one of the conversations we had in the in the other piece was around consistency of data and we just talk about even about open banking data in terms of like are we all interpreting it the same way um you know one of the previous calls uh today we were we were talking about you know, you know, we all like to get into detail around the information to understand, you know, where where is the value on that. But we can have different interpretations of it, and but that interpretation can add cost as well. I mean, is there is there an issue around consistency of the way we, we look at this information? Um, and I, I mean, Andrew, I was going to come to you just in that, particularly as you look across multiple lenders as well. I mean, do you, do you is that consistency? Do you think it's going to be an increasing issue that we're going to have to deal with going forward? I think it will because each lender is entitled to make their own credit risk decision, whether they're doing that based on uh, bureau data or open banking data or um, current account turnover, the conduct of current accounts. Yes, I think there will be. Uh, and I'm not sure I'd call it an inconsistency, Chris, because I do think they'll be all using the same data. Um, I don't think you can really interpret open banking data too differently. You know, it's bank account transactions. It, what's ha happened has happened. It's then how that information is taken in to make lending decisions that I think will be inconsistent across lenders. But that's that's lending. That's exactly what happens today based on cost of funds, credit risk appetite, what segment of the market you want to lend to, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think that the data they take will be the same. The way they decision off of it will be different. Yeah, that's why it's just the different different kind of interpretation of that, which becomes. I mean, does that become? I mean, Alabanga, that becomes, I suppose, a, a competitive competitive advantage in terms of that's that's where it's being seen. Is like how you interpret the data becomes a competitive advantage around, you know, making the best use of it, either for you know additional lending or for taking cost out or for for, for maybe restricting lending as well. Is is that the way you kind of see it? Yeah, um, for me, it's similar because uh, what we are finding consistently now is lenders are sort of moving into a specialist market that the same information that they have access to, they're looking at a particular sort of client to cater for. So they're interpreting it differently to, to make sure it's suitable for what they're doing. So we, we're having more of new lenders coming into our space where they're sort of specializing in certain sort of clients. And that is based on the 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 market size of those sort of clients and the competitiveness of of having product that fits into those and it's helping them get more access to clients at the same time allowing them to interpret whereby they were actually telling us that if it doesn't fit on the high street just come to us we will take them on and it's the same data that they're both accessing it's just their own way of using it that's different from the other lenders i mean some of, some of that piece can be i mean it's no different you know you see with with mortgage i would like just like you see with mortgages i suppose you you can't get it from the high street lender because they won't do it but you go to a you get you go to the specialist yeah. lender for like buy to let or those kind of things right okay yeah, yeah. And, and what about inclusivity i suppose because that kind of speaks to that which is almost like you have these vanilla lenders sitting at the top making vanilla decisions which are very very which are more automated then you get into specialists so like where, where does inclusivity fit, in, uh, fit into that in terms of like making people sure that people have access to the loans that are right for them i mean is it going to start resulting in in making uh, you know having manual conversations to then start to underwrite the loans i mean andrew you talked a bit about that earlier around you know you're seeing some of that those complex cases coming through do you think that's going to be a theme even for the you know, the purely digital le lenders are going to have to have some sort of manual intervention being set up just in the name of I inclusivity. So the moment people are being excluded from, potentially could be excluded from the market if they don't have that. 
Uh, yeah, they could. And I think that's a challenge for the um, the digital only lenders that they're going to have to overcome because you're absolutely mm. right. There is an inclusivity piece here that that's probably not being looked at as strongly um, as these lenders were setting up. But consumer duty is definitely bringing it to the floor and everybody is talking about it. So, yes, there are digital lenders that will adopt some more manual processes, um, which seems counterintuitive, doesn't it? But it is it is around that financial inclusion and there are still and Brian talked about it earlier on the linking of bank accounts through open banking has absolutely made it easier to go across multiple bank accounts but there are still certain banks that you can't access transactional data through open banking because they're not signed up to it they haven't got their open banking game in order um, and therefore you are still requesting physical bank statements from certain banks because you can't access the information through open banking so for, for that reason alone there are manual processes in there chris for, for for that to make sure that inclusivity is there going back to a previous point i think it's linked are there other data sets that that we can use to make decisions to improve inclusive to improve inclusivity I, absolutely I, I i believe there are and this links to ai and machine learning we're working very closely with a very innovative lender coming to market who's received a decent amount of funding from a from a tier one high street bank to get this product moving and they're looking at customers that are coming to the market who are graduates and so they have elected to stay in education until they're kind of 24 25 and then they hit the market and the kind of route at the moment is a low and grow credit card or an expensive unsecured personal loan because they're a thin file and they've got no credit history what this firm is doing, which is really exciting, is actually looking at these customers, looking at large data sets and, and, and almost lookalike audiences and saying, well, we, we are going to know from a machine learning perspective that this customer that's kind of grown up with this background, went to this school, um, studied at this course and is looking for a career in this field, has a strong, weak or moderate propensity to repay the loan and will make a lending decision based off the machine learning algorithm as opposed to a credit history that's just not there and i think that is also going to become increasingly part of lending decisions as we improve financial inclusion but also as new entrants come to look at a very crowded market in the uk it's different as brian was saying to, to the irish market there's lots of lenders and so they have there has to be innovation and new data sets enable that innovation above just efficient processes and the use of open banking so there's there's new data sets and i suppose the other aspect is then recency of data as well so like you know it's like how recent is it versus you know time lags of information i mean like how important is is recency of data or how important has it been i suppose with um, with the changes that have taken place over the last six months i mean is it is it becoming ever more important and will it be important in the future as well um, and Brian, do you want to maybe just take that in terms of like you know, the recency of data, having the most up-to-date data, is, is that is that become critical as much as the information itself? Um, yeah, absolutely. I suppose just speaking from our own experience, we're just mining further into our own data within our own portfolios and mm. see what we can learn from that um, to improve and fine tune our current underwriting. That's our, our current focus. Um, but absolutely, I suppose I, I certainly wouldn't be any expert on other sources of data that's out there that we could use. We're not using any at the moment. We remain open-minded to obviously look at any of those things. Um, but the best I can say there, Chris, is we're just further fine-tuning and mining into our own data to see what we can learn, how that can help and make better underwriting decisions. And in particular, back to your inclusion, uh, credit inclusion point, to uh, probably um, um, underwrite and approve cases that were currently declining based on the point that Andrew just made there on you know, customers' profiles, history, where they went to school, all that data. So we're trying to build a better picture around that area to help us improve our underwriting decisions. And um, so that's that's where our current focus is on. Mm. And I suppose, how, how does that come back to things like transparency? I suppose, because that's, 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 because you have explainability and transparency around, around some of those, those, those trends as well. I mean, do you think that's going to get more complicated as we sort of, we get into that? I mean, just maybe just come back quickly on that, Brian. I think it will. I suppose we're at an early stage in that journey, Chris. So, um, you know, I can't speak from much experience. We're just, we're currently mining the data with data and analysis people just to look and see what we can learn, what trends and graphs we can form from that. So it's very early stages. <clears throat> Maybe if we were speaking in 12 months time, I'll have a, we'll have more experience in that, how we'll it's working in that. terms of transparency and things like that. But, you know, at the moment, I just don't know. 
we'll, we'll come back on that. Uh, I, I suppose uh, we'll come back in 12 months. Um, so, I mean, Alabengo, I suppose in terms of like, um, you know, speed of decision, I mean, uh, and we talk about digital around sort of improving the speed of decision. I mean, how important do you think that is for customers? I mean, so like, because we have almost like different time frames for loans. You have like shorter term loans, and then you have longer term loans such as mortgages. I mean, is speed of decision really that critical? I mean, and is it the same in all, in all market sectors, do you think? Uh, it's it's actually important in terms of where we find ourselves because we've got these sort of people that we work with that are very impatient. Mm. Uh, they're constantly chasing, they're constantly demanding perfection, urgency to completion of of uh, mortgage cases. Where so we're finding the lenders are having to adapt themselves because brokers are forced to chase the lenders. So finding ways to make it easier to give uh, answers quicker is is key, and the, sort of I think there's improvement. In, so if, in I, if I put, if I put my consumer duty hat on, do you think it leads to better outcomes uh, by having faster decisions, or do you think it sometimes it's better to to maybe even enforce um, maybe a little bit of a slower decision to get a little bit of time for reflection? I would say it's not as good as it will be for consumers because it means. We trying to be more efficient means it will turn to ticking box kind of process. If it doesn't fit in, pass it on, move on to the next one. Whereas if they are allowed to walk and ask the extra questions, they will give clarity to the underwriters that will allow them to to make a decision. But if it's more focused on quick process, there will be some clients that customers that will lose out on the benefit of allowing the lenders to actually walk and get to a decision whether instead of ticking the box that it doesn't fit in let's move on or this fits in let's sell i mean when it comes back to this with the concept around friction and when we build friction in our journey versus not i mean we're almost like looking at a point now where you can have these frictionless journeys and you've got this i mean andrew you just talked about 60 percent were hang on, they were frictionless journeys frictionless lending decisions i mean do you think we'll get to the point where we're going to start to be mandated or um at least at least the conversation started to have around where we need to introduce friction into things a bit like you have cooling off periods when you're buying some products but but having that in terms of like lending decisions do you think that's do you think that's a theme that's coming through or, or is it just it's frictionless all the way yeah, it's certainly not a theme that, that's coming through. I mean, it's interesting you look at it from a consumer duty perspective and mm. allowing the customer the ability to take a bit of time to think. You've got to marry that with the competitive landscape of if there are customers that have got multiple offers from lenders and they come to a marketplace such as Freedom to get that, then speed of decisioning is is and speed of kind of access to funds is we're finding really important to customers <laughs> because you know, they're not waking up in the morning thinking, I would like a loan. They're waking up in the morning thinking, I would like an extension on the property and I need a loan to get that done. And therefore, you know, the loan is the means to the to the, to the need. Um, and speed of decisioning and accuracy of decision, which is something we've not spoken about, they are important to a customer. A customer doesn't then have to execute that loan offer there and then. They can take the time should they wish. The offer stands in most cases for at least kind of a couple of days for the lender to think about. But that certainty and accuracy of offer is important to a customer, I believe. And I do believe how quickly lenders get to that um, speed and accuracy of offer is a competitive advantage or a competitive disadvantage. So I do think lenders will continue to work on speed and accuracy of decisioning. And I suppose it's competitive if you've got multiple offers, right? So if you've got multiple yeah. offers, then that becomes competitive for the businesses. I mean, do you think it's, um, but do you think, do you think the regulator will start thinking about how, how they mandate that? Because it sounds like the businesses aren't going to put it in as a consumer. I'm not sure I want it because I, I know what I want. I'm going to make a decision. Is that, is that a regulatory type, type aspect that would have to be introduced if it was, to, if it was felt to be, be like that, almost like taking a, a higher view around where well, you need to have, you know, three days to basically make the decision? Sounds like it'd have to be the regulator. Yeah, I think if it's going to come in, it would have to be um, kind of regulatory driven. Mm -hmm. That we're not seeing any any lender discussion, uh, any lender discussions around that. And certainly, we've not had any customer feedback or dissatisfaction because a loan has been made available too quickly. So I don't yeah. think it's going to be lender or consumer driven. And I suppose it's just whether we, whether, whether you, I mean, how, how are we best determining what the outcomes are? Right? The, the outcomes are the, you know, it's it's what the, um, how, how do they word it? It's what the, um, you know, the, the desired outcomes for the customer to meet their financial objectives. I mean, that's, that's I mean, 
do we need time to, I suppose the, hy the hypothetical question is, do we need time to, to make sure that loans are meeting their, their um, uh, financial objectives uh, with a bit of reflection? And I don't know how we're going to approach that with consumer duty coming up. Any thoughts on that, um, Alabenga maybe? Uh, I think um, for me, I'll prefer if it's possible to do sort of an hybrid approach to that process for that, because it allows um, a bit more efficiency in terms of getting both well uh, the process to the client and also to to the, to the lenders um, efficiency and let me put it this way it's uh, it's in the uh, it's in the lenders and the consumers pros uh, benefit for things to work properly for us so but when we start getting uh, regulators into the process it makes it a little bit more challenging because they will see things from their point of view and it will just be their experience that they will use to to make decisions which will probably impact the process and those the growth the process that we're expecting the outcome we're, we, we're looking at yeah i mean i suppose at the end of the day it's around how do we get good outcomes um, yes. As much as I mean, speed can be part of that, but it can, you know, it's also about, but really fundamentally, it's about outcomes, which came up on the on the previous previous calls. Um, so, so, so if we look at um, just just look at, I suppose, the, the next sort of like, you know, five years or so. I mean, where 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 does where does lending technology take take us from here? We talked a bit about data. Um, we haven't talked about um, you know decisioning type technology ar around that and sort of like and how do we sort of use technology to sort of like improve decisioning. I mean, where, where do you think where do you think we we go we we go from here? Um, you know, there's been a lot of conversation around data, but what, what's what's next? I mean, Andrew, what's your kind of view? Um, I think from from my perspective, that does depend on the product vertical because I think mm -hmm. there are you know, decisioning and, and use of data to get to decisioning quicker or more accurately is varied across unsecured personal lending, asset-based lending, mortgages, auto finance, because there are there are other elements involved in, you know, if you take mortgages, for example, you need to ensure you've got the security on the property, same with vehicle finance, et cetera. So I think we're going to see that move at different paces, depending on which product and, and which asset class that we are we are talking about, Chris. I do think over the coming years, there will be, other data um other data points used in decisioning beyond just credit score and open banking i absolutely do believe that and i do believe yeah. that that will create a wider lending market than we're seeing today i think it will create more accurate decisioning up front rather than lenders kind of saying yes based on the information that i have right now i can say yes but i may say no further down the line when i get other information I need from the customer to conclude a full lending decision. That's where I see data being used in lending decision up front, as opposed to it being used in underwriting. So it's almost decisioning and underwriting done in one go, whereas today it's a bit of a two-step process. What, what, what about things around things like embedded finance? Is that that's that sort of flows through? Um, so on one of the previous calls we had around like salary finance as an example, right, which is almost like embedding it into into processes. You can have it in retail finance, different than embedding, because that gives you extra streams of information. Do you think, well, do you think that's, I know it's been talked about, but do you think that'll be an increasing theme where it becomes a little bit more seamless as to where the finance is coming in? Um, I mean, you're sort of seeing that that, that could be a new competitive, potentially competitive process that's coming into the, the financial services market. Uh, absolutely. I think we'll see more and more of it. It gives brands that are non-financial services brands that have engaged mm -hmm. customer bases. It enables them through APIs to have direct access to financial services marketplaces and for the customer to have access to those marketplaces in that brand's environment. So within an, an app that they use for another brand, they can access a financial services marketplace through APIs and data-driven uh, lending decisions. So uh, it, it's there now, something that we focus very heavily on, and I do see it becoming a almost a market in its own right. Yeah, and it, and it's an access to additional data stream in, in, in many ways as well that that, that isn't necessarily uh, there at the moment. I mean, Brian, what, what's your kind of experience in terms of like where you think where you think the market would go next, either in terms of products or in terms of that technology? Um, I, we would like to see the open banking feed into 
part of the automated underwriting process. At the moment, we're using open banking from a, a manual underwriting point of view to assist our, our manual underwriting process, but we feel hopefully uh, in the pretty near future that will feed in more to automated underwriting. I suppose open finance is going to be an interesting one, especially for restructuring, um, helping vulnerable customers, things like that. We'll be interested to see how open finance actually um, and, and when that comes to, it comes to bear. Um, the whole thing around salary finance is interesting and buy now, pay later. Um, the UK market is much more evolved and further down the road in that area, but it's an area we're looking at. We've developed a, a salary advance offering. It's not a loan, it's more a, a salary advance offering for employees to, to employers to offer their employees just to help, you know, cash flow issues and things like that. The uptake in that is very slow uh, in the Irish market, but it's one we've ready and we're looking at and develop and have developed, but it's very, very slow. So um, to summarize, open banking, open finance, I think we've high hopes for um, the whole salary finance side of things. I definitely think it's going to evolve and take off and uh, we just have to keep a close eye on it. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and what, about the, what about the mortgage market, Alabengo? Do, do, do you think, I mean, where, where, where do we go from here? Um, I mean, you talked about, about you know, the, the extension of the, of the, uh, the mortgage market um, from, you know, from prime into like almost like the broker relationships, having like specialized lenders, et cetera. I mean, where, 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 does, where, where do we go from here and what role does technology have? Uh, well, um, I remember going to an event recently that the, the lenders were actually talking about certain things that they're doing behind the scene to make it more to make their business more digital focused. So I believe it's gonna play a bigger role because of their process, their decision making and the speed to get into to to where things need to be. So I believe it's gonna be bigger than where we are right now. But I still believe there will still be some resistance that some part of the market that they're dealing with will prefer the old way of doing things, which is normal. But the older the the population grows, where more and more young people are coming into the working space, adapting to the digital lifestyle, that they will be more open, which will allow the lenders to be more digital based than uh, manual underwriting. So in the next five years, I see the digital aspect of open banking, open finance to grow further than where we are now. And yeah. it will for the better, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, do you think, think how digital has changed our, our world over the last even even five, six years? I mean, pretty much, um, I mean, how many people are now making decisions if it doesn't have an app, then, then the, you know, do you actually buy it, right? So uh, mm -hmm. uh, so if you, if you look at buying things online, so it feels like that sort of like, it's, it feels like from a customer service point of view, that's been a huge kind of change. I suppose it's what happens in the background in terms of like, you know, to be able to facilitate that and whether that's sort of, you know, all, all seamless in the, in, the, in the back end, really. So um, it feels like there's been a huge amount of change anyway. So um, so uh, we've got no more questions. I don't think there's any more questions. So uh, if, if, if not, I think um, I was going to thank each of the panelists uh, just to say, uh, say thank you very much. It's as fascinating as ever. Um, if say it feels like we're a, a bit of an inflection point in the, Lots, lots more to come, no doubt. So, uh, Colin, I'll, I'll hand back to you. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks, you. Chris. That was perfect. Thank you. So, yeah, just a quick one for me. To, uh, yeah, really great uh, conversation there. Really interesting to hear uh, the different backgrounds that uh, our panelists have got, uh, not only in this session, but across the day. Uh, really great to, to hear that. So, thank you to them. Just a really quick one for me. So, I just wanted to say, uh, firstly, a big thank you to our sponsor, Experian, for making today's event really possible um really good so appreciate that their support for thanks for that and of course thanks to not only this panel but our speakers across the day they're all listed here um let's all give up quite a lot of time not just during this event but for uh, in the build up to it as well so massive massive thank you to them i uh, just want to bring up really quickly um we've got a number of events coming up uh so uh in july we've got a collections version of this event called the collections technology think tank but virtual one uh, again, so we're going to run that in July. We've got another lending technology one. We like to run them every six months uh, in early September. So hopefully some people will join us for that as well. Um, we've also got a face-to-face -face event as well later on this year. So that is the um, Credit and Collections Technology Think Tank, 23rd of November. Uh, date for your diary there. It'd be great to see uh, some, people, some of you there at that event um, getting more attended uh, each year as we move forward. So that's really good. And that's tailed with... The Credit and Collections Technology Awards, which is on the um, same well, same day, it follows in the evening of that event. So hopefully we can get um, lots more 
people involved with that event as well and we, we get to meet each other face to face a lot more these days which is perfect so um yeah but i just wanted to end by thanking uh andrew brian olivenga and of course chris warburton especially for his uh, chairing across the whole day it's a very uh interesting and it, a lot of work goes into that so massive thank you to chris but i'm just going to finish up now by saying thank you to everybody who's tuned in as well and um, we hopefully will see you all at a future event uh with credit connect soon but thanks a lot have a good good day cheers bye-bye all right thanks thanks